This program is brought to you by RTS on iTunes U from the Distance Education Department of Reformed Theological Seminary. For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920. Well, all very interesting, but now what about religion? We're still here at Reformed Theological Seminary, and we want to ask questions about religion. And you remember that both in the Tractatus and in Logical Positivism, it was thought that religious language was very problematic, either cognitively meaningless or perhaps uh, 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 mystical or uh, perhaps emotive, to use the positivist's grab bag. Uh, they had little respect for religious language, although they tried to find some role for it to play. Uh, now, what the role is, what's Wittgenstein's uh, view of religious language moving into his second phase? Well, religious language, he says, is a peculiar use of language that's found among certain groups of people. Uh, they use it for transactions, they use it for language games, and therefore religious language in general is, is meaningful. But, says Wittgenstein, uh, it has to be used <coughs> in the proper way. Now, you see, Wittgenstein is, uh, seems to be wide open here. Uh, he seems to be saying, all right, if it's useful, then use it. <laughs> you know, if it has a use, then, then go ahead. But uh, he's also, as a philosopher, he's, he's trying to determine what the proper uh, use of a term is. And so uh, when, when we ask uh, uh, the uh, meaning of time, uh, the proper way is to simply play the game. Uh, the improper way is to ask what the essence of it is and to treat time as a metaphysical object. So uh, even though Wittgenstein seems wide open and emphasizing our freedom and, and so on, he does close off alternatives uh, fairly regularly. And that's what he does with religious language as well. He says that whatever religious language is, it is not scientific language. And it has to be distinguished sharply from scientific language. How is it different from scientific language? Well, for one thing, uh, scientific language usually claims uh, only uh, probability or possibility, that some, some things are probable or possible. This is not, of course, when you're talking E equals MC squared, scientists usually say that's certain. But even there, of course, they, they allow for the possibility that experiment could uh, lead to a change or modification. But in religion, uh, Wittgenstein says it's... Uh, People are always claiming certainty, all right? That's kind of odd. Uh, why is it that the religious people uh, are so certain that God exists or so certain that Jesus is the Son of God or that Jesus died for our sins? Uh, well, Christians offer reasons for their statements. They say, look, in the, the Bible says this and that, and there's this historical evidence and so on and so forth. But that doesn't uh, impress Wittgenstein very much. Uh, Wittgenstein says that the uh, religious people uh, use these evidences for, uh, to make them bear more weight than they really ought to bear. Uh, uh, religious people claim a higher degree of certainty than their reasons actually permit. Now, this is really the old verification problem coming back again. I mean, this is still, uh, Wittgenstein is still saying, hey, you guys, if you want to be on the same level of science, you, you need to, to verify. You, you need to use scientific uh, method. But we don't. And so, so Wittgenstein's conclusion here is not that religious language is meaningless but that religious language has a completely different function, completely different use from scientific language. Uh, another difference 
is that uh, religious language has a large emotional component. Uh, that is, when I say God exists, there's a lot of feeling connected with that, a, a, an allegiance, a love connected with that that you don't typically have with scientific statements. Uh, further, religious statements tend to make belief or disbelief a moral issue. Uh, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, then you're going to hell, okay? As if it's a bad thing to disbelieve and a good thing to believe. And Wittgenstein says uh, 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 scientists don't do that. I don't know if that's entirely true. Uh, I've heard scientists say terrible things about people who disbelieve in evolution. Uh, uh, another thing, uh, religious language regulates the conduct of people who use it. Remember how Immanuel Kant said that the uh, religious language is regulative, not constitutive? Well, uh, Wittgenstein says religious language always has a moral component to it. It always uh, has a... Uh, a component of governing uh, the way we act, the way we do things. So, he says, uh, religious language is radically different from scientific language. Uh, and therefore, uh, religious language must never be used to question scientific theories, like the theory of evolution, for example. Uh, religious language is okay as long as you limit it to its own sphere. Uh, it has a unique use. It must be kept in its own compartment. And similarly, scientific language shouldn't be used in such a way as to try to refute religious language. Now, you know, this sounds kind of uh, original, kind of creative, but, uh, you know, a lot of people have written this way. A lot of people have said things like uh, uh, the Bible and science belong to different spheres. Uh, science tells us what happened, and the Bible gives us the value of what happened, that kind of thing. That sounds richly in. Uh, and uh, so uh, a, a lot of people have, have done this, even evangelicals sometimes do it, saying science belongs to this sphere, religion belongs to this sphere, and so they never uh, uh, ought to conflict. You have the religion, uh, religious sphere, which tells you how to be safe from sin, and then you have the scientific sphere which tells you how the world is made. That would be fine, except that the Bible also tells us how the world is made. The Bible tells us some things about the creation of the world. The Bible tells us uh, some things about the way God, uh, the way the course of nature is governed by God's word. So it doesn't, uh, the Bible does not uh, divide uh, our experience into two uh, uh, hermetically sealed compartments, one called the religious and one called the secular, although some people are putting a lot of emphasis uh, trying to renew that uh, distinction today. But uh, anyway, uh, 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 that's Wittgenstein. V Wittgenstein's usually considered to be especially bright and especially original and not like anybody else. But here he's using a, a formula which is uh, very common. You know, it goes back to Thomas Aquinas's. Uh, distinction between natural knowledge and uh, supernatural knowledge. Well, uh, that's, that's uh, Wittgenstein's view of religion, and of course I think it's uh, entirely uh, inadequate. I think that the religious language is comprehensive. Uh, I think religious language is very broad. Religious, uh, somebody who belongs to a religion the religion tells them how to live the rest of life in every sphere of life. And it's certainly true of Christianity. I think that's also true of uh, other religions. Uh, uh, whether your God is false or true, uh, that God makes a comprehensive claim on your life. In Christianity, we're told whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So uh, uh, our faith governs our uh, uh, our worship, but it also governs our business and our homemaking and our, our rest, our holidays, our f uh, child rearing, our studies uh, in uh, geography and history and science and all the different things. Our, our faith governs everything that we do. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, Wittgenstein is really distorting 
uh, the nature of religious language when he suggests that it can be confined uh, to one particular uh, orbit. Uh, just one other thing about the later Wittgenstein, his book called On Certainty. Uh, this is an interesting book. It follows uh, Charles Peirce, actually. If you go back there, uh, you find Peirce saying similar things. Uh, Wittgenstein uh, says there are two kinds of doubt. Now, Descartes, remember, said that we ought to, uh, as part of our method for gaining knowledge, we ought to, ought to try hard to doubt everything that it's possible to doubt, a universal doubt. Well, uh, Wittgenstein says there are two kinds of doubt and two kinds of knowledge. There's practical doubt that can be resolved by methods that are accepted in a particular language game that lead to practical knowledge. So if I'm, uh, uh, if I'm in doubt as to uh, uh, whether there are any forks in the drawer, I relieve, I relieve that doubt by opening the drawer and looking in there to see if there are some forks in there. That's practical doubt. Uh, that's doubt uh, uh, that can be resolved. There's a clear method for resolving it, and resolving that doubt uh, has a practical purpose. So uh, uh, the point is, uh, uh, is acting, uh, not seeing, but acting. Then on the other hand, there's doubt that is merely theoretical. Uh, like Descartes' doubt, you know, you try to doubt everything and you find that's very difficult to do. Uh, that would include, for some of his examples, uh, uh, doubt that I have two hands. Hold up your hands in front of you and then try real hard uh, to doubt that you have two hands. You, you can't do that. Doubt that other people exist uh, when you're looking at them. <laughs> that's pretty hard to do. Doubt that the world has existed more than five minutes. Uh, very hard to do, very hard to prove that it's existed more than five minutes. Uh, this kind of doubt, Wittgenstein says, is illegitimate because it uses terms like doubt outside of its ordinary context, outside of its language game. And therefore, when you relieve doubt and you call it knowledge, there are also two kinds of knowledge, knowledge uh, used in the practical way uh, and knowledge that's merely theoretical. Uh, terms like doubt, believe, and know, uh, you should be using those within ordinary language. This is why we call it ordinary language philosophy. You should be using these in the context of ordinary language, uh, not uh, in some theoretical way. Now, epistemological theories, he says, often try to relieve theoretical doubt. But uh, since theoretical doubt is illegitimate, uh, these epistemological theories are useless because they stretch language beyond its limits. For example, you, you all know what I mean when I ask, uh, is it four o'clock? Four o'clock happens to be the time when I hope to end this lecture. Uh, is it four o'clock? Uh, you know what that question means and you're prepared to answer. Uh, now, if I say, is it four o'clock on the sun? What would you say? Well, it stands to reason, doesn't it, that the, if it's meaningful to ask, is it four o'clock uh, uh, in Orlando, Florida? And if it's meaningful to ask, is it four o'clock in London, England? It certainly ought to be meaningful to ask, is it four o'clock on the sun? <laughs> but as a matter of fact, we all know that it's not meaningful to ask, is it four o'clock on the sun? And if somebody says it is four o'clock on the sun or it's not four o'clock on the sun, what evidence could he bring? How could he verify it? See the the verification principle is not entirely dead uh, here. Uh, verification often comes in as a criterion of whether uh, language is being used meaningfully or not. So uh, uh, what evidence can be brought to bear uh, is not no stronger, he says, than the original assertion. Uh, if we question our basic certainties, certainties like... Um, the world has been here more than, more than five minutes. 
then we're just questioning our whole way of life. Uh, but more to the point, we're asking meaningless questions. Uh, we're asking questions outside uh, our language game. And, uh, but now, how, how do we define the proper language game? How, how do we know that we're playing the right, right language game? Uh, Wittgenstein says, usually it's something that we inherit. Um, intuition, uh, what would it be like to doubt that I have two hands and try to relieve that doubt? So you can ask questions like that uh, to show yourself whether you're on the right track, whether you're talking uh, meaningfully or whether you're uh, talking merely theoretically uh, in a way that's illegitimate. Uh, you know, Wittgenstein sometimes says it's like a car that's spinning its wheels, you know. Uh, that's not getting any traction, that's, that's not moving anywhere. Uh, and, and that's what this theoretical kind of language uh, is, is about. But I keep asking, how do you know? I mean, uh, Wittgenstein would say that a lot of theology is just spinning your wheels. It's using uh, words in a theoretical way. And I say, why should I believe you, Wittgenstein? How do you know? How can you prove that to me? And uh, so we, we sort of reach an impasse at that point. Um, there's a little bit now. I, I, I'm hoping that as we move through the history of philosophy, you're making comparisons. Uh, think of Thomas Reed, for example. Thomas Reed, uh, who also took up this problem of uh, uh, how we know that other people exist. How do we know that the world has been here for more than five minutes? And Reed said, you just have to assume, you just have to, uh, uh, it's just common sense. Uh, there's no way of proving it, but it's common sense to believe that other people have minds like I do, and to believe that the world has been here for more than five minutes. So uh, we use common sense. And Wittgenstein is, is kind of a common sense philosopher here. He's kind of saying that uh, uh, we should stick to, to common language. Uh, see, there's always a linguistic twist here because it is the 20th century. We have to stick with common language. We have to stick with the, our common language games, uh, stick with our common practices in the use of language. Well, in the later Wittgenstein, there are many useful points about the richness of language. I think that... Uh, though that uh, even the later Wittgenstein is caught up in the rationalist, irrationalist dialectic. Under irrationalism, I would say he's uh, hostile to metaphysics, and uh, he wants to uh, uh, make you, uh, allow any use of language to be wide open, to give people freedom to use language any way they want to, and not to make judgments about whether language is meaningful or not. On the other hand, there's rationalism where he tries to show us what kind of language is meaningful and what kind of language is not. The critique of metaphysics rests on the notion of proper use. Uh, Wittgenstein tells us we have to use words in the proper way. But what is the proper way? Wittgenstein never defines that in general, um, except in a question-begging way, and all of uh, all our use of... Uh, Language is made to conform to this notion, but the notion is so vague that it becomes a pretext for asserting prejudices. He doesn't like metaphysical language, and so he says that's not the proper way to use it. But what if I say, you know, Hegel was playing a language game too. You know, Hegel was uh, playing a game with his fellow philosophers <laughs> and with other people who read his, his, uh, his work. Uh, if there were any non-philosophers who read his work. But that's a, that's a game too, isn't it? That's a use. And we shouldn't be criticizing Hegel for using words in a, in a kind of way that's unusual to us, speaking a somewhat different language from the one that we, we speak. Uh, I think Wittgenstein uh, makes some useful points about the distinctiveness of religious language, how it's different from scientific and all. Uh, he makes some points that are not so useful, but religious language is distinctive not because it deals with some narrow, peculiar subject matter, 
nor because it's properly used only in certain restricted areas of life. Religious language is distinctive precisely because it is presuppositional and therefore demands authority over all of life. Uh, and I kind of agree with uh, Wittgenstein about certainty. Again, defining the language game is difficult. It's not obvious to me that general doubts or metaphysical doubts are always illegitimate. I think there's a useful function to be able to analyze this question, uh, do I have two hands? Uh, and, and if it's nonsensical, tell me why it's nonsensical. But these metaphysical games are also played, you see. Wittgenstein thinks it settles the discussion to say, well, the language game is played, and we have to reconcile ourselves to that. Well, uh, there, there are games that are played uh, that he doesn't seem to recognize the legitimacy of. Okay, I want to move on now. Uh, the later Wittgenstein takes us up until about Oh, 1960. Wittgenstein died, I think, about 52, but uh, his work was not widely distributed. See, when he died, he had published only only two things. He published the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, and he trans he published a little essay on ethics, which is more uh, more fits in with his early thinking than his later thinking published nothing in the very fruitful later phases of his career. Uh, if Wittgenstein had worked for a, a university with a publish or perish policy, uh, Wittgenstein would have been uh, fired uh, early in his career and never allowed to come back. But uh, everybody agrees that Wittgenstein is a genius, uh, one of the really formative thinkers, and so, you know, uh, uh, be flexible here, recognize that some people can be very brilliant even if they don't uh, publish very much, and that, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's okay. Uh, you know, the academic establishment does not have the final word uh, on uh, who is important and who's not, and who's edifying and who's not uh, edifying. Uh, so, uh, uh, Wittgenstein's writing after he after he died, they 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 investigated all the shoe boxes that he had used to gather sayings and on different topics, and and some of them were labeled and some of them weren't. And very shortly afterward, there was a flood of books uh, with Wittgenstein listed as the author, and uh, for the next twenty twenty five years. Uh, these books keep came kept coming out. Uh, every couple of years, there would be a new Wittgenstein book on something or other, until uh, he became known as a very prolific author indeed. So uh, uh, he kept influencing more and more people, and I think the uh, the influence of the sec uh, of the later Wittgenstein continued all through the 60s and through the 70s and into the 80s, and then it began to fade a little bit. It still exists. People still refer to him all the time, and I, I think uh, Wittgenstein was probably the most important secular philosopher of the 20th century, probably the most influential uh, secular philosopher of the 20th century. But here we are, and uh, as I give this lecture, and uh, uh, we have to assume that uh, time marches on and that there are continuing developments in philosophy. I won't bring you entirely up to date in this course uh, because uh, uh, I, don't com I don't keep completely up with the times myself, but there are a few things that maybe we could talk about that uh, fill in the years between Wittgenstein's day and our own day. So uh, under Roman numeral number four, I have a section called Topics in Contemporary Epistemology. And there's one title there that you can uh, look at, a uh, book by Jay Wood, who's a Christian, uh, published by InterVarsity, I think, uh, called uh, Epistemology. Uh, you, you very often hear people talking about foundationalism, and a lot of people say uh, we don't want to be foundationalists, we, we want to be non-foundational, we want to have a 
non-foundational epistemology. And I, I want you to understand a little bit about what's going on there, what that means. Uh, foundationalism is the idea that uh, uh, human knowledge is based on some kind of uh, uh, some kind of starting point, some kind of foundation. Uh, you remember that Descartes began this way. Descartes uh, uh, tries to push aside everything that he had ever believed, uh, push aside tradition, push aside religious dogma, and to believe only what he clearly and distinctly perceives to be true. And what he clearly and per distinctly perceives to be true is his own doubting, his own thinking. Well, uh, uh, that then becomes the foundation, and everything else is deduced from that. I think, therefore I am. I am, therefore there is a sufficient cause to my being, and we'll call that God. Uh, and then uh, everything else kind of follows along in its train. Uh, Baruch Spinoza did the same thing. He started, his foundation was a series of axioms uh, in a geometrical after a geometrical model, and you presuppose these axioms, and then you deduce from those axioms uh, the nature of the world as it must be. Uh, the empiricists had a different idea of the foundation. The empiricists uh, said that uh, all human knowledge rests upon sense experience, see, not clearly and distinctly perceived ideas, as in Descartes, but sense data, sense perception, that's the foundation, and then everything else is built on that. So uh, philosophers have debated down through the years uh, what the foundation is. Uh, that is a foundationalist approach, and the interesting thing about uh, later philosophy, modern philosophy, is that some people have tried to do philosophy without a foundation, or without a, a, a single foundation at any rate. Well, uh, foundationalism uh, has uh, certain goals, one, uh, and it has certain advantages. First, uh, a clear structuring of beliefs. Second, basing beliefs on a certain foundation, so that gives us uh, assurance. Uh, C, clarity and justification. Uh, when you're trying to justify a belief, tell somebody why uh, I believe what I believe. Well, you try to, to show that uh, this belief is based upon uh, a more fu a fundamental belief, and that one is based on still a more fundamental belief until you get down to the foundation. So when you justify your claims to truth, or justify why, why you believe something, uh, you, uh, uh, you uh, uh, ultimately are referring to a foundation. Now the main distinction in foundationalism is between uh, basic beliefs and non-basic beliefs. The basic beliefs are the beliefs that are justified, uh, are, are the beliefs of the foundation. The non-basic beliefs are the ones, uh, are the beliefs that receive their justification from the basic beliefs. This is the structuration of our thinking. This is not necessarily conscious, nor does it necessarily reflect the actual process of people's reasoning. Uh, but it is normative. The claim is that the way our knowledge ought to be structured is to follow these particular uh, goals. Now, people sometimes distinguish between strong foundationalism and uh, modest foundationalism. Strong foundationalism versus modest. Modest is sometimes called weak foundationalism. Strong foundationalism uh, believes that the, the foundation is infallible, or at least of, of the foundation we are absolutely certain, we are invincibly certain, we cannot be persuaded uh, that the foundation is wrong. The foundation may include uh, such things as the following. Now remember I distinguished earlier between Descartes' idea of the foundation and the empiricists' idea of the foundation. Well, Wood says that the foundations can include things like this, uh, self-evident truths 
immediately known when understood. For example, no part is greater than the whole. Uh, or, for example, the axioms of logic and mathematics. Uh, uh, two, another thing that we sometimes find as part of a foundation, incorrigible propositions like Descartes' I exist or Russell's I am in pain. And we probably shouldn't call those infallible, but, uh, uh, but we can't be corrected. I mean, if I say I'm in pain, <laughs> you can't argue with me about that. You may argue uh, that I'm not really sick. You may argue that it's uh, all together in my mind, but you can't say, John, you're not in pain because <laughs> I know I'm in pain. I'm, I'm the only one who knows. I know for sure that I'm in pain and nobody can correct me about that. Uh, you, as long as you stay with the description of your own feelings, you cannot be refuted. Uh, that's true about witnessing too. <laughs> um, a third element in foundations would be truths evident to the senses like Hume's impressions, like Russell's sense data, like Roderick Chisholm. Roderick, Roderick Chisholm said uh, uh, one, one element of the foundation is uh, appearances. And, uh, you know, let, let's say you're looking at a tree. And you might be wrong. I mean, maybe there's no tree there. Maybe that's an optical illusion. Or... Uh, uh, but, but at least the one thing that you're absolutely sure of is that you seem to be seeing a tree, okay? There's an appearance of the tree. There's a phenomenon uh, called the tree. It looks to you like it's a tree. And, and Chisholm says the way, one way you can put this uh, is uh, I am appeared to treely, <laughs> okay? Turn the noun into an adverb. Uh, I am appeared to treely. That is an infallible statement. Nobody can question that uh, any more than they can question your feelings. They can't question how things appear or appear to you. Uh, and then, of course, uh, within strong foundationalism, there's the process of derivation of non-basic beliefs. How do you get the non-basic beliefs out of the basic beliefs? Uh, how do you get the non-basic beliefs out of the, out of the uh, foundation? Well, Descartes, of course, believed that only logical deduction uh, is the proper way. Uh, logical deduction is the only approach that preserves certainty. Uh, others, of course, would say that induction is also legitimate, even though induction permits only probable conclusions, but at least uh, we're certain as to the probability of uh, what is revealed to us by induction. Now, uh, Wood says there are a number of problems with strong foundationalism. One problem, uh, how do I know that I know? And uh, mustn't we assume that this logical structure reflects reality? And uh, Wood says actually we accept many other beliefs without support without, re, re, without uh, relating them to any foundation at all. We accept the reliability of our senses, but that's neither self-evident nor incorrigible nor evident to the senses. The general reliability of the senses is not something that you can perceive and you can't reduce that to any foundation at all. And, and so, uh, and even truths that are supposedly self-evident depend on what uh, would calls background beliefs. For example, uh, Descartes' uh, uh, sentence, I exist. Well, who is the I? Uh, I presupposes a background belief uh, that you're used to thinking about yourself. Sellers says that perceptual beliefs are unintelligible without connections to past experience. Uh, you know, if if you had never perceived anything in the past, and that all of a sudden you, you, you perceive the clock back there, it really isn't a perception. I mean, you really don't perceive the clock because you can't make any connections between that perception and past experience. You don't know that it's a clock. You don't have the, uh, the concept of a clock. And you don't even know what's happening to you uh, if you don't have past experience of perceptual beliefs. So uh, 
Well, we, we can go on and on. A, a lot of philosophers have said that our observations are, uh, uh, they might seem foundational, observing that the, that the wall is blue, observing that the clock says 11 o'clock, that might seem like a foundation. That might seem like it's so solid that we can build all our other knowledge on that. But actually, no. Actually, these beliefs uh, come in a context. Uh, my, my, my experience of redness, my experience of blueness comes in a context where I've seen blue cars and blue uh, sky and blue water and blue things in the past. Uh, so it's not just a momentary sensation, and therefore uh, it doesn't serve as an absolute foundation for all my other knowledge. Well, there's a whole uh, bunch of arguments uh, in, uh, over the last uh, 50, 60 years from people like uh, Stephen Toolman and uh, Thomas Kuhn and Norwood Hansen to the effect that observations and theory are not easily separable. People sometimes say, well, you're uh, in science, you begin with observations, and then you build your theory upon that. The observation is the foundation, the theory is the superstructure. But, uh, but these men uh, argue that uh, even in science, you don't really observe something uh, without having a theory. In science, you use a series of instruments to make your observations. But those instruments are based on a kind of theory of how things work. So you have uh, observations based on theories, which are based on observations, which are based on more theories, which is to say that observation and theory are all mixed up, and neither one of them is simply the foundation for the other. So uh, none of these is absolutely foundational. None of them serves as the ground of, of certainty. For strong foundationalists, we must not only have foundational beliefs, but we must also know why they are certain, and that's a difficult criterion to meet. Also hard to know how this criterion could be met, except by basing the foundational beliefs on even more foundational beliefs, and that leads to a, an infinite regress. But anyway, these are the kinds of arguments that have persuaded a lot of people today that strong foundationalism doesn't work as a theory of knowledge. And uh, you'll never be able to come up with some, some uh, amount of knowledge that serves as the foundation for all of our other knowledge. So uh, uh, there's a possibility of a more modest foundationalism, and I begin this on the next page. Uh, modest foundationalism. In modest foundationalism, we again have basic beliefs, but the beliefs are not absolutely certain. They are uh, what might be called, said to be innocent until proven guilty. There's a, a judicial analogy. Uh, we start off with certain beliefs. We find ourselves having those beliefs, and they might be wrong, but we, we keep them until uh, uh, we run into a refutation, until somebody shows us that they're wrong. These are sort of like uh, Thomas Reed's common sense axioms, uh, universal, indispensable, irresistible. Uh, they don't require us to be aware of what propositions are basic. We may believe them since they're pro pro produced by reliable epistemic processes. Well, more on that later. But uh, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, there's some of the same prob problems here uh, that there are with strong foundationalism. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, it undermines, uh, it underestimates the possibility of disagreement about basic beliefs. A lot of people disagreed with Thomas Reed about his claims to basic beliefs. Or some people might argue for basic beliefs that don't meet, meet uh, Reed's criteria. For example, planting uh, uses uh, the existence of God as a basic belief, uh, which Reed did not do. Well, uh, let's try still another approach. This is uh, evidentialism, 
which is associated with W.K. Clifford. Clifford uh, wrote a famous article around the turn of the century called The Ethics of Belief. And I think this is great that uh, people are seeing epistemology and ethics uh, uh, as dependent on one another, and uh, the people recognize that there is an ethic uh, of belief. Uh, and uh, uh, Clifford uh, wrote this uh, uh, essay, uh, and, and we'll be talking more about that as we move on, uh, the ethics of belief. When is it right to believe something? When is it wrong uh, to believe something? Uh, well, David Hume said, but it's always, you know, how interesting how often the name David Hume keeps coming up. Uh, David Hume said that it's always wrong to believe something unless you have sufficient evidence. It's kind of a primitive form of the verification principle. <laughs> it's wrong to believe anything unless you have sufficient evidence for it. Uh, Clifford agrees with Hume, and Clifford uh, follows, uh, follows along uh, with Hume's argument and expands it a little bit and elaborates it a little bit. Well, this is kind of a foundationalism in which evidence uh, is the foundational thing. But then the problem is there must also be evidence for the evidence, and so this leads to an infinite regress or perhaps to a form of coherentism, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, this is sometimes urged on pragmatic grounds, uh, that we need just to live our lives, to have evidence for the things that we believe. But uh, is this criterion sufficient to establish truth, the criterion of evidence? Uh, and furthermore, Clifford uh, is assuming that evidence has to be consciously held in order to believe something. You must uh, know why you believe it. Well, Reed and others would question this. Uh, uh, why, uh, you know, if I'm four years old, do I have to have uh, evidence for everything that I believe uh, in order to believe it? Certainly not. Now, often we have experience, so we, we just believe on the basis of experience, even though we don't have evidence to uh, establish our interpretation of the uh, uh, experience. Uh, Weikstra defends Clifford a little bit. He says uh, uh, at least somebody in the community should have evidence. At least somebody in the community should be able to defend this belief. But must I believe only the things that people here in my community, uh, Oviedo, Florida, <laughs> that people in my community have evidence for? The um, question is, how much evidence is enough? And there are different differences in different fields that way. So here's another approach uh, to epistemology, uh, coherentism. Uh, coherentism says that a belief is justified just as long as it fits in with the rest of what we believe. So it sees our knowledge as kind of a system. Uh, uh, we have this belief, this belief, all of these, and the challenge in knowing the world is expanding the system, uh, finding new facts and, and bringing them into the system. And the chief challenge is to find beliefs that are consistent, uh, beliefs that are coherent with the other beliefs that we hold. And Lawrence Bonjour and, and, and others uh, are known as coherentists. They uh, say that knowledge is basically uh, the formation of a uh, large coherent system. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, old beliefs must always uh, uh, be held to against incompatible new beliefs. Sometimes the old belief must go. Uh, the point is to achieve coherence. Uh, what is coherence? Well, coherence is logical uh, coherence, uh, non-contradiction. But you have to remember that many systems uh, can be non-contradictory. You know, uh, two plus two is four. That's one system. Uh, 4 plus 4 is 8, that's another system. Those two systems are not contradictory to one another, but they're not the same. And it's possible that you could have competing geometries. Maybe Euclid's geometry is consistent with itself. Some non-Euclidean geometry is consistent with itself, but those two systems are inconsistent with one another. So you have to choose 
And that's where coherence becomes a difficult thing to do. Uh, some people say that coherence uh, is, uh, should be understood as explanatory power. Uh, how do you explain uh, a new fact? Well, uh, can you do that through coherence uh, alone? Uh, having a co coherent set of beliefs may be attributable to pathology. Uh, uh, you know, uh, paranoid people uh, sometimes develop fantasy worlds that are remarkably coherent. And how do you show the paranoid that that, uh, that uh, fantasy world is not true? So uh, there's a lot to be said in favor of uh, coherence theory of knowledge, but uh, uh, there are problems that come up here too. Keith Lehrer interprets coherence as competition. Uh, you, you have to accept your beliefs in the interest of gaining gaining truth, and when someone comes on like the paranoid uh, with a weird kind of system, uh, you have to reject that system, at least initially, even though it appears to be very, very consistent. Um, if, if there's no competition between one belief candidate and another, uh, Lehrer says you should anticipate possible objections, and you ought to be able to rebut those objections in order to believe justifiably. But Wood uh, disagrees with Lehrer. He says this process can lead to more objections, to more rebuttals, to infinite regress. And if you must have a belief about the coherence of your belief with others, that belief requires justification ad infinitum. So it's very hard to show that a new belief coheres with your old belief unless you ask hundreds of questions about it and uh, it seems like that it's just not very workable. Well, another approach to epistemology is called reliabilism. And uh, reliabilism, uh, first, is a brand of uh, uh, externalism. Now, foundationalism and coherentism are internalist because they justify beliefs by something within the knower. If you're a foundationalist or co coherentist, you judge, uh, you judge beliefs by how well they fit in to your own system, a system that is within you, a system that's within your mind. And that system may be foundationalist in character, it may be coherentist in character. But the idea is that you're arguing with yourself. Uh, your, your, your criteria for what beliefs you accept or what beliefs you reject are other ideas, uh, other concepts that you already have uh, in your mind. That's known as an internalist epistemology. But so, and uh, I, well, I won't go into more detail. These are doxastic forms of internalism. You can uh, look up, uh, uh, do some thinking about what that means. But uh, in a uh, uh, foundationalist and conservative or coherentist view, that is an internalist view, justifying a belief involves being able to justify it to myself and then uh, to others. But it's possible that I could be justified in believing something even if I cannot uh, um, justify it to somebody else. For example, uh, take the knowledge of young children. Uh, take many of the beliefs that I, I have right at this moment, but I haven't been able to think about much. Uh, the belief that it's 11.15 in the morning. Uh, so that, that, these facts uh, suggest the possibility of an externalist uh, justification. A belief is justified if it's rightly related to the truth, regardless of whether I might myself be able to justify it. This is the idea that, that fundamentally my beliefs are true if they're connected to reality. Reality is external to me. And I, I know there are a lot of philosophers we've talked about that don't like that idea of external and internal, but uh, I'm, I'm expounding some thinkers uh, now that uh, do think there's some point to that, uh, think there's a difference between 
uh, justifying beliefs because they fit with my past beliefs and justifying beliefs because they're connected to some truth out there because they, they're connected uh, uh, externally uh, to the truth. Now here the term justification takes on a somewhat different meaning. Internalist justification is subjective. It represents my own reason for believing something. Externalist justification is objective. It appeals to the way in which a person's cognitive judgment, uh, cognitive equipment is related to the world. My brain uh, is able to make connections to the real world and therefore uh, enables me to have true beliefs. Reliableism then says that we're justified in believing something, believing P, let's say, if that belief is produced by reliable epistemic processes. And there are different views of reliability. Uh, I won't go through those in detail. But there, there are problems with this, you know. Uh, and, and, and I think the, the biggest uh, problem is, uh, you know, how do you get outside yourself? Uh, I mean, I know what's in my mind. Barclay used this argument. I know what's in my mind, but I don't know how my mind is connected to something outside myself. Unless, of course, God comes and tells me. <laughs> okay, so they're, 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 this may require a theistic justification, and I think when we talk about Alvin Plantinga, we'll see how he uses uh, this problematic as an actual argument for the existence of God. Well, uh, let's skip some of this material and go down to D, relation of the above views to biblical epistemology. All Christian views, uh, all Christian beliefs must be brought into accord with Scripture. In that sense, Christian epistemology is foundationalist. Scripture, though, warrants propositions that are not found in Scripture. The scripture tells us to, uh, to test and see that the Lord is good. Scripture tells us to have experiences. Scripture tells us to uh, get involved in the world and to make judgments about uh, uh, situations and to make judgments about other people. So it warrants propositions that applies, as I say, to propositions that are not in Scripture by way of deduction, induction, abduction, and application. But as we can argue from uh, for Scripture from uh, extra-scriptural premises, as long as those premises are themselves warranted by Scripture, uh, in this sense, Christian epistemology is coherentist. So Scripture presents us with a coherent understanding of things. And what we're trying to do as we go out into the world, we're trying to uh, integrate new beliefs with that Christian system and without violating the, the Christian system at all. And that would be a coherentist way of understanding Christian epistemology. Ultimately, however, the truth of our beliefs is determined by God himself, particularly his providence in creating us and redeeming us from sinful distortion of the truth. In that sense, Christian epistemology is reliableist. So uh, the truth of our ideas is a function of uh, uh, the gifts that God has given us. And the fact that those uh, intellectual gifts, those uh, epistemic gifts, uh, are reliable and they're functioning right. And uh, only when they're functioning right can we be sure of, of the truth. So that would be a reliableist interpretation of Christian epistemology. But we need also a subjective justification of things. We need uh, to uh, be able to uh, uh, give uh, to ourselves reasons why we believe things. Uh, that would be existential, situational, and uh, objective, uh, normative, because we, we seek uh, coherence with God's word. Okay, well, uh, that's just my way of... Uh, of uh, evaluating this discussion from a Christian point of view. The preceding program has been brought to you by RTS on iTunes U and may not be reproduced or disseminated in part or in whole for sale or for profit without express written consent. 
For more information on RTS degrees and programs, please visit us at www.rts.edu or call 1-855-854-6920.